Good afternoon and welcome to the MODIS GI KOL call on improving in inpatient endoscopy outcomes with the PureView system. At this time, all users are in a listen only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If you would like to submit a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded and a replay will be made available on the MODIS GI website following the event. I'd now like to turn the call over to your host, Mark Pomerantz, President and Chief Operating Officer of MODIS GI. Please go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the call this afternoon and appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, to join us this afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Seth Gross. Uh, Dr. Gross is the Associate Professor of Medicine at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine and Chief Clini and Clinical Chief of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the NYU Langone Health. As a gastroenterologist, Dr. Gross specializes in advanced endoscopy procedures. His clinical practice is focused on the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of gastrointestinal precancerous conditions and cancers such as esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Dr. Gross's research interests lie in the areas of gastrointestinal malignancies, as well as quality and innovation in endoscopy. I would like to turn it over to Dr. Gross to uh, talk to you about the issues in inpatient colonoscopies and the value of peer view. Uh, th thanks very much, Mark. Uh, pleasure being with everybody today. And we're going to talk about something that, that's really important. Uh, most uh, uh, people in the, in the public just think of colonoscopy as an outpatient procedure. But believe it or not, there's a tremendous amount of endoscopy that's uh, done uh, for patients admitted to the hospital, uh, specifically colonoscopy. And that actually is a, a clinical challenge. And so I'm, I'm going to share with you some background around uh, colonoscopy that takes place inside of a hospital and where pure, the PureView system could fit in to improve our overall clinical outcomes. Next slide, please. So the objectives uh, over the next 15 or 20 minutes is to discuss the clinical impact, uh, review some of the economics around uh, patients staying in the hospital at higher levels of care and just prolonged uh, level of stay at the hospital, review the technology and highlight some important clinical data uh, that uh, shows the efficacy of PureView uh, for this uh, patient population. Next slide, please. So when we think of the inpatient colonoscopy, there are many reasons why patients get admitted. Uh, probably the more common, uh, you see the image at the bottom right of your screen, that's a colon, and inside that colon there's, there's lots of blood. And sometimes it's very difficult with uh, a traditional bowel cleanse that the patients have to attempt to drink uh, in the hospital. And the reason why I say attempt to drink is that it could certainly be very challenging for them uh, being admitted to the hospital to drink uh, four liters of a, of a bowel cleanse uh, prior to colonoscopy. Uh, many of these patients have a lot of other comorbidities. Uh, they're, they're elderly. And as I mentioned, uh, probably the most common reason we're doing colonoscopy on the inpatient setting would be for gastrointestinal bleeding, but there are other reasons, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and abnormal finding uh, found on uh, radiology imaging. So there are a bunch of uh, indications, uh, but all of them require a bowel cleanse in order for us to successfully do the colonoscopy. Next slide, please. So when we think about the, the pre-procedure uh, preparation, it certainly can be a challenge. As I just mentioned, it's about four liters that the, the patient has to drink. The most common preparation we see in hospitals today is something called go, go lightly. Uh, patients could be in the ICU. And they're also, for the most part, when you're in a hospital, you're, you're pretty much bed bound. You're not walking around like you normally would at, at home. And uh, that certainly can make it difficult. Sometimes patients are on medications that slow their gastrointestinal motility. So it, it makes it a little bit more difficult for that bowel cleanse to, uh, to, to work. And we know that about 50% of patients uh, that are prepped in the hospital for colonoscopy, the bowel preparation isn't uh, adequate. And we have a scoring system for that. I'm gonna talk about uh, that scoring system called the Boston Bowel Prep, which we use to gauge the cleanliness of the colon by segment, and you want a total score ideally uh, of eight or nine. Next slide, please. So what's, what's our typical pathway for someone? A patient gets admitted to the emergency room and they're presenting with a uh, lower GI bleed. 
uh, the patient then starts the valve prep down in the emergency room or is uh, usually brought up to a higher level of care. So this could be an intensive care unit bed or, or a monitored bed. And then they're asked to undergo this rigorous bowel prep over the course of several hours uh, to be ready for the procedure several hours later that day uh, or the next uh, morning. And again, it's that four liter prep, which is a, is a lot of volume. Uh, that bed is occupied until we figure out what's going on with the patient's bleeding or if the bleeding should stop on, a, on its own. We still need to do colonoscopy, but as mentioned, about 51% have an insufficient prep. So they sort of hang out and linger in the hospital and we will either not bring them down to the endoscopy suite or send them back upstairs when we do the exam and it's, and it's inadequate. And as you could imagine, that uh, certainly impacts the efficiency of a hospital. It impacts uh, the cost to healthcare because these patients will stay uh, in the hospital longer than they should. And it's gonna prevent these patients from the ultimate goal for both the patient and the ph physician team taking care of them, which is to go home. Uh, next slide, please. So when we think of uh, inadequate bowel prep, uh, it has a, a tremendous uh, effect. Uh, patients are on a restricted diet, typically a clear liquid diet. Uh, the staff need to, to monitor and keep checking in on that patient uh, to make sure they're drinking that cleanse. Uh, there's always a challenge of bringing the patient uh, to the endoscopy suite and rescheduling. You have to remember the hospital is a, is a very busy uh, place. Uh, the patient continuing to be on this liquid diet and having uh, this uh, continued bowel preparation could certainly impact their electrolytes and that could uh, be problematic and that could even further delay the procedure from that standpoint, even when they're, they're ready based on uh, being cleaned out. And the procedure times could be long because we need to spend more time to clean out the colon so we get good visualization. Uh, we're not gonna sign off on someone to go home if we can't clearly see the surface of, of the colon. Next slide, please. So when we think of all-cause mortality, we learned from, from the endoscopy literature, and certainly applies here for colonoscopy, that uh, we want to be successful on that first colonoscopy. And uh, the all-cause mortality goes up if we have to bring that person back for more than one colonoscopy, if we have to bring in other services. So say we can't successfully identify the cause of the gastrointestinal bleeding uh, during colonoscopy when we believe it's a lower source, we may need to bring in other services such as interventional radiology uh, or surgery for that matter. And as you can see on the graph here, that increases the mortality of that patient during that hospital stay. And we really wanna minimize that. And one of the keys to minimizing that is for making sure that we could have a colonoscopy where the visualization is good to excellent when we're trying to evaluate that patient uh, for gastrointestinal bleeding. Uh, next slide, please. So when we think of the cost for staying in a hospital uh, for a regular bed, you know, non-monitored, it's about uh, $2,200 a day for a nonprofit and $1,700 for profit. And the ICU bed is like being at a suite at a top hotel. It's about $4,000 a day. So aside from the, the healthcare costs, which are illustrated on, on this slide, it also ties up the bed for other patients that could be coming through the emergency room that needs, needs this bed. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of the, the key uh, quality metrics uh, that impact the hospital system uh, when the bowel prep is inadequate. So you have delayed or canceled procedures, uh, difficult diagnosis because we can't clearly see what's going on, and increased uh, length of stay. The other thing that could happen is the patient gets discharged and they get readmitted with the same symptoms. In this case, we're giving the, the example of gastrointestinal bleeding from, from the colon. The patients are dissatisfied and frustrated because they're trying to do this uh, cleanse, but they can't drink all the all the fluid that's required. They're, they're away from their, their family and loved ones. They're, they're sort of stuck in the hospital. It impacts the efficiency and flow of the hospital in terms of bed turnover. And when we think of incidents, other things could happen to a person in, in the hospital. Yes, there's excellent care that happens in hospitals, but our goal is to get patients out of the hospital in a safe and effective manner as quickly as possible because other things could uh, come up. And when you look at uh, CMS performance uh, metrics and average cost per discharge, and it certainly impacts the operating margin for a hospital. So there's, there's a tremendous uh, impact when someone gets admitted for a gastrointestinal issue that's arising from their colon and we need colonoscopy to, to better understand what's going on. Uh, next slide, please. And in the last eight months or so, we've all experienced the impact of a, of a global pandemic. 
Uh, New York City, as, as we all know, initially was uh, hit quite hard with this, uh, leading to bed shortages where our whole hospital had uh, coronavirus patients. Thankfully, uh, today that is significantly improved and it causes a, a bottleneck uh, for, for patients to get their procedures done. And it certainly increased uh, costs because we have to keep getting COVID tests for these patients and use uh, personal protective equipment. And we could minimize uh, and save those resources if we could get this right the first time and someone could go for colonoscopy. And if their bowel prep isn't uh, completely adequate, we could use the PureView system to, to salvage that bowel prep and do a, a very good and excellent exam. Next slide, please. So what are some of the limitations of the current technology? So when we think of what we currently use uh, for, for colonoscopy, we have our tower, we have our monitor, and what you're seeing here is a, a water pump. And, and the water pump could be effective if the overall bowel cleanse is quite good, meaning there's very little in the lumen. And when I look at the walls of the colon, they look quite clear and there's nothing to wash off. But many times that's not the case uh, in a hospitalized patient. In a hospitalized patient, there's still a decent amount of liquid and solid stool burden. And there's also often a coating on the stool, excuse me, on, on the colon wall, which could be stool or blood. And it's sometimes very difficult to irrigate. And, and when you hit the, the foot pedal uh, in, in the traditional water uh, pump, it gives you a single jet and we're trying to clean off a very wide area. So, so it's not efficient and oftentimes it's not very effective. Uh, next slide, please. So when we think of how the, the PureView system could certainly improve upon what we're doing, uh, let's just look at that cross section uh, showing the tip of the scope. So you see that the, the scope is uh, put through this uh, sheath and these, this sheath one has two large suction channels and that's very important because we're dealing with some viscous, thick uh, fluid, blood, stool inside the, inside the colon, and we need to be able to safely suction that out. But the other thing that you see is that there are four irrigation jets. And what I just showed you with our traditional pump, it's one jet. So here we're getting four jets and we're having additional suction channels to really highly wash the colon and power wash the, the walls of the colon and then aggressively uh, suction it. And uh, just all the way to the right is the uh, PureView uh, system itself. But you can see how much more effective that is uh, when we're trying to uh, wash off the surface of the, of, of the colon. It's sort of similar to if you had a power wash your garage door in your house. Uh, and if you were just using a, a very weak hose uh, versus uh, something that has higher pressure and a wider field of spray, that will make that job go much, much faster. And that's what we're seeing clinically uh, with PureView in the colon. Next slide, please. So I had mentioned this uh, earlier. Uh, there is a scoring system that we use uh, to determine if the colon is uh, adequately cleaned. And it's something called the Boston Bowel Prep. And we divide the colon into three segments. And the score could go anywhere from zero to three. Uh, three is excellent where there's nothing uh, on the walls of the colon and is completely clear. And we want to get a total score ideally for an adequate exam uh, of, uh, in my mind, eight or nine. Uh, but we'll say that the, the, you know, the lower limit is uh, seven. And, and what you're seeing here are, is the published studies before and after peer review. And the, the black bars uh, show a suboptimal bowel cleanse in these studies. But then when the pure view was instituted, you could see that it took the prep for something suboptimal and suboptimal for, for the person performing it would mean that we need to bring this person back. And for the hospitalized patient, it would mean that we need to send that uh, person back upstairs. And then they're going to have to do additional bowel cleanse to come back down. And hopefully the bowel cleanse will be uh, good enough where we feel that the exam is satisfactory. And in these studies, you see the rate went from 38% uh, to 96%. And this is a significant uh, improvement and statistically significant as well. And you can see that on the, on the bar graphs there, uh, 5 to 8.8, 2.8 to 8.5, or, or, and 3.7 to 8.9. So we've salvaged these patients. And, and that's a tremendous win for the patient, for, for clinical care, and for hospital operations as a whole. And this just sort of uh, summarizes it. Uh, and the take home here is that we could take a, a bowel cleanse that is truly suboptimal, meaning the patient needs to repeat the exam and we could uh, salvage it and make it an excellent exam 
96% uh, of these patients in, in the studies. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna give you two clinical scenarios uh, that we typically see in the hospital. So this first one is a six-year-old male with end-stage renal disease, uh, presents with diarrhea, and needs a colonoscopy. Uh, the plan is to do an overnight uh, bowel cleanse, and I mentioned the four liters of Golightly. Uh, the next morning, the endoscopy unit calls the medical floor because we're ready for this patient. We wanna do the exam, but the patient only drank half. And we know that half is not good enough because the patient is still passing uh, brown stool. So what typically happens, we're gonna either tell that patient to keep drinking and do them late in the afternoon, or we're gonna cancel the procedure for today and we're gonna move them to the next day. Next slide, please. Our second case is also a very common scenario that we see at the hospital. This is a 70 year old female who presents with bright red blood per rectum, and this is around eight in the morning. There was a colonoscopy done four years ago showing diverticulosis. This is important because these pockets that we see in the colon sometimes could bleed. The plan is for this patient to have a rapid colonoscopy prep, which is we ask them to drink those four liters in over four hours with the goal of doing the, the procedure uh, later in the afternoon. At 2 p.m., the patient is still passing blood with a clot despite drinking 75% of the cleanse. And that's a, that's a, a clinical challenge for us. We're going to ask that patient to continue to do the bowel prep, but at the same time, we also have to realize the patient's actively bleeding. So it's not surprising that the patient is still putting out blood with clot because the bowel cleanse doesn't stop the bleeding. We actually need to do an intervention to try to identify the bleeding first, the area, and then uh, treat it. And so this patient also would get pushed off. And the thing with gastrointestinal bleeding is that it potentially could stop or the patient gets uh, very sick and unstable and then we have to involve other services and send them to interventional uh, radiology. Next slide, please. And so if we put PureView in this uh, situation, uh, for, for case one, uh, we would bring that patient down, they'd undergo their colonoscopy, even if there was some liquid brown stool, we'd still be able to do high powered irrigation from those four ports and then have the additional two suction ports. Our scope also has a suction port, so we have three suction uh, channels and we could successfully complete that colonoscopy. Uh, for case two, a uh, similar situation, uh, we would go in and bring that patient down to uh, the procedure area, do the colonoscopy, and use the uh, benefits of PureView to uh, suction out the, the blood and blood clots and do a high power uh, washing of the uh, lining of the colon. And just today I was in endoscopy uh, this morning and I was listening to the inpatient service and uh, they were they were saying what I'm just talking about, which was they, we had a bunch of patients on the schedule. Uh, some of them had a, a mixed uh, cleanse. And so the their plan was to uh, have PureView available and ready for use. And we had four colonoscopies today and I believe two or three of them are gonna have PureView on board uh, ready to go uh, to, um, to clear the colon out. Uh, next slide, please. So let's go through the, the hospital protocol, the standard protocol, which is what we're currently doing. Well, actually at my institution, we're starting to really incorporate peer review. So we'll just go through the standard. So you have the adequate bowel prep all the way to the left and the procedure is completed. But if you have a uh, high risk for inadequate bowel prep, what's this gonna do? It's gonna, we're either gonna delay and reschedule or we're gonna proceed with the procedure, hoping that we could get by. Uh, if we complete it, great, but typically we're gonna to have to uh, abort the procedure because the cleanse is inadequate and we can't see anything, and we send the patient back to the, to the floor. Now, if we institute the peer review protocol, the colonoscopy is ordered. If we have an adequate bowel prep, we bring the patient down for the procedure and complete it. But if there's a high risk for inadequate bowel prep, and how do we know it's high risk? You know, there are some patient predictors like elderly, obesity, immobility, diabetes, a history of a poor uh, bowel prep, uh, dysphagia, heart failure, where you're limited to the volume. But then there are risk factors for day of procedure. So what we do is we actually ask the, the nursing staff to send us a picture of what the effluent looks like. And you could see here it's graded uh, one through five. We really need things to be a five. Or, or at the minimum of four. Uh, but when we use a peer review protocol, we could go down to a, a grade one or two and still feel confident that we could bring that patient down and complete the colonoscopy with the aid of peer review to get good visualization and to get to the root of why this patient was admitted to the hospital. Next slide, please. 
And when we think about uh, the success we're starting to see uh, in the in the hospital, there, there is certainly benefit in the outpatient colonoscopy area. There's tremendous opportunity. You know, there's a tremendous amount of colonoscopies being done in the outpatient setting on a daily basis, and patients struggle in a similar in a similar way, uh, where they have a difficult time with the bowel prep. They have a lot of comorbidities, and when we have suboptimal bowel preparation, we have poor visualization. And the main goal for outpatient colonoscopy is to identify polyps, especially precancerous ones, and uh, remove them. So outpatient colonoscopies performed at ambulatory surgery centers or hospi hospital outpatient departments could certainly benefit from uh, peer review. And peer review could lead to more patient compliance because there are patients that are hesitant to have this procedure because they're concerned about the difficulty uh, with the uh, bowel prep. Uh, this could certainly reduce cancellations, aborted procedures, and early repair procedures where we do the procedure where we think we had an okay view of the colon, but instead of bringing that person back in, in say three years, we bring them back in, in one year and we, we shorten the intervals and, and that patient undergoes uh, additional colonoscopies that potentially could be avoided by having the peer review system available in the outpatient setting. Next slide, please. So to conclude, there are clinical and, and economic ramifications when we are unable to complete a colonoscopy in the inpatient setting. And this is critically important for patients that are presenting with gastrointestinal bleeding. And peer review certainly improves upon that uh, for patient satisfaction, patient outcome, physician satisfaction, and it can help the efficiency and flow of a hospital. And this fills an unmet need, uh, especially in our inpatient population. Uh, but we're definitely starting to see the benefits both in the inpatient setting, but also I think this could certainly be applied uh, to the outpatient setting for screening and surveillance colonoscopy. I want to turn it back over to Mark. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Gross. Uh, greatly uh, appreciate your insights and uh, on the patient population and uh, what you're seeing with the peer review system. I'm just going to uh, go into a short a little corporate uh, company update uh, for everyone. And then uh, after this, we will turn it over for uh, Q&A. You can go to the next slide, please. So just want to uh, kind of recap a little bit uh, of what Dr. Gross was talking about uh, as far as his, what he's seeing in the inpatient population and the challenges um, around that. And you know, as you guys can imagine, NYU, uh, the Langone Hospital System, you know, is not unique in the issues that they are seeing around uh, these very difficult uh, colonoscopies and these patients, you know, that are, you know, certainly have comorbidities and elderly that make the burden of PrEP, you know, much more difficult than a, a healthy person getting a colorectal cancer uh, screening um, as well. So, you know, not only, you know, are there clinical benefits, but the financial burdens that uh, were talked about. As Dr. Gross mentioned, uh, you know, this is a very common issue, unfortunately, you know, in this patient population. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the, uh, there's multiple studies out there that show in the range of about 50% of these inpatients, you know, are delayed or aborted in their colonoscopy due to concerns around uh, preparation uh, as well. Um, obviously, as you can imagine, uh, you know, the patient experience is, uh, is dramatically improved to say nothing about the value for the, the institutions um, that are dealing with these uh, very sick patient populations. And one of the big things we're seeing is, as Dr. Gross mentioned, which is critical is, you know, we are changing a, a standard of care and, you know, driving that peer review protocol and pushing that, uh, you know, as, as centers are beginning to adopt the technology you know, as something that we're finding very useful with working with them on instituting that, you know, across the uh, institution. You can go to the next slide, please. So our commercial progress uh, has been uh, really moving along nicely since uh, things have begun to open back up over the last uh, month and a half, two months, you know, from the pretty uh, serious, you know, lockdown that we've seen, you know, due to, uh, to COVID. So certainly, uh, as we talked about previously, you know, Q2 and the early part of Q3, uh, things were fairly tightly closed. But in the last uh, six or eight weeks, we're really beginning to, uh, to see, 
you know, the hospitals open up and we're really making some nice progress in moving forward uh, with our commercial plans. Uh, we're currently in approximately 20 hospitals with the system today, um, training a significant amount of gastroenterologists uh, on the, the use of the system so that when various physicians are on call uh, to cover these inpatients, you know, we have a nice breadth of physicians you know, being able to use the device, you know, and then as we get those large quantities of physicians in the institutions up and trained, it really allows that institution to embrace that peer review protocol that Dr. Gross was talking about. You know, certainly COVID still remains challenging in several institutions, but, you know, we're very happy to see the flexible approach that uh, we instituted uh, even back in Q2 with some of our virtual tools to do training virtually and all, and really being flexible on working with the training schedules and time with the hospitals is really working out uh, very well. And it's actually really nice to see, you know, how quickly hospitals are really embracing, you know, much more virtual techniques and virtual training. Uh, and that's working nicely because uh, we've done a nice job getting those tools up and running in a very rapid fashion. As you can see, you know, which is really our key strategy, we're working with some of the top institutions uh, throughout the US, um, NYU obviously being a premier one, uh, but multiple other key healthcare systems. And we continue to get uh, significant things on our schedule for evaluations, you know, in some of the uh, continuing top systems uh, across the country as they begin to, uh, to open up and allow uh, evaluations for new technology. So we're really excited you know, about how things are, are moving and are really allowing us to start to really get the ninth breath, you know, in these really key influencer national and regional centers, you know, as part of our strategy to really build a nice baseline for the technology to then move her out to a greater audience over time. Next slide, please. One of the things too, as, a, as an organization, you know, not only do we want to make sure that we're driving out the, uh, the commercial opportunity, but we continue to build on the nice momentum that we currently have and really continue to invest in the right clinical data to really drive the use of the technology um, across the, uh, the entire US and you know, ultimately uh, worldwide as well. And as you know, Dr. Gross talked about, you know, GI bleeds is a critical patient population. And when you really look at the most urgent version of those patients, so these are patients that have a very acute GI bleed. Um, you know, many of them will be in the ICU. You know, they may be getting a transfusion because of the, the amount of bleeding. So we are, you know, in the, uh, the cusp of embarking on a clinical study just focused on these ICU critical patients to really show the uh, ability to peer review to cleanse these patients. And this is a study with basically no traditional purgative-based uh, preparation. So they will go straight in, you know, after admittance uh, from the uh, emergency department uh, up into the ICU, and they'll get what's called a, a bedside colonoscopy, it's where the colonoscopy equipment is wheeled into that ICU ward with a peer review on its roll stand coming in right next to it and being able to evaluate these patients within a matter of hours um, after coming in from the emergency department with nothing more than a, uh, a small enema just to open the entry to the bowel and then cleansing the entire colon uh, with peer view to really try to find the source of those bleeds, you know, and ideally uh, create hemostasis by clipping them or other technologies that can stop that bleed. So we're very excited about uh, this study, which we'll be uh, embarking on here in the uh, relatively near future. Next slide, please. So just in summary, um, as we've talked about, you know, obviously this inpatient challenges, you know, are a universal challenge, you know, in pretty much every hospital, not only in the country, but throughout the world. And we're really starting to, uh, to see how nicely Peerview is really addressing, you know, the challenges around preparation, the timing for patients that need that early urgent colonoscopy, and really helping, you know, not only the clinical care, but addressing a lot of the inefficiencies that exist in this patient population. As I mentioned, our market rollout is really going along, uh, really according to plan. We're working with the right institutions, 
um, and really starting to get great feedback um, from our key physicians you know, and these premier institutions you know, as they begin to institute the peer review protocol. As I mentioned in the previously, you know, really continuing to drive value and evidence of the clinical impacts and economic impacts of peer review you know, is something that in this organization we continue to drive that with increased studies and publications, you know, supporting the great value of the peer review system. We also continue to invest on new, new products and market expansion opportunities. Dr. Gross mentioned looking at the, the outpatient population, uh, which uh, we believe is an exciting uh, opportunity in the future, you know, especially when you look at patients that really have significant uh, issues with prepping. So elderly patients, patients with comorbidity, uh, which really, you know, as much as they would like to prep, um, they can't, you know, patients with renal compromised function are very difficult as well. So we think there's a nice portion of the population, you know, that can really benefit uh, in the outpatient setting and avoid those early repeat or canceled colonoscopies that were talked about, but also looking at new op market opportunities in the upper GI space and other areas where the technology can be incredibly valuable as well. And last, I think, as everyone could appreciate, you know, especially if you were a, uh, a patient or one of your family members where, you know, the benefits that peer review provides, you know, most importantly for the patient, but certainly helping the physicians, Dr. Gross talked about, you know, really helping the, uh, the providers out in the hospital by reducing those costs, freeing up those hospital beds. Um, and even, you know, for the nurses and the other staff, you know, you can imagine, you know, having to support these patients that may be somewhat immobile, trying to prep, you know, and the fun that uh, the nurses would, uh, would have, unfortunately, with, uh, with all those issues associated with it. So with that, I will turn it back over to, uh, to Sarah, and then we'll jump into some Q&A. Thank you, Mark. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to submit a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please hold while we pull for questions. First, like to uh, to introduce uh, Matt O'Brien to uh, to ask our first question. Matt, if you'd like to unmute your line and uh, ask a question, that would be great. Mark, I don't see Matt in the queue. Okay. Well, uh, next in a uh, question as well, so I will. Uh, read that. Um, so Matt's question to Dr. Gross, how has NYU adopted the technology? Is it technology who might need peer review and who doesn't? And is the cost an issue for the hospital? So so all uh, Im important Seth, questions. Like answer that question? uh, yes. Uh, do you hear me okay? So, so, uh, so the yes, way we have a very um, uh, large inpatient service and we have someone that oversees that service. We really we have a director of inpatient services and uh, we've really worked with the uh, hospital floors uh, for them to get a sense of when the patient's uh, bowel prep is adequate. And as I mentioned earlier in, in the past, uh, we really wanted the effluent coming out to be pretty clear. Uh, we, would, we would not want to see a lot of blood and we, we would not want to see a lot of uh, uh, liquid or semi-solid stool. Uh, now that we have peer view available, uh, that is less of a barrier, and we're, we're bringing patients down that have not uh, finished their bowel cleanse, uh, or even if they finish the bowel cleanse, if the effluent isn't clear, we're still feeling confident that we could do a, a satisfactory, really an excellent exam uh, using a peer view during that uh, individual's uh, colonoscopy. Uh, so, so it's uh, really worked out quite well. We've um, nicely integrated it into our daily practice uh, in the in the hospital setting. Great, thank you. Um, next, I'd like to ask uh, Kyle Bowser to uh, to ask uh, any questions. Kyle, if you could please uh, unmute your line, that would be great. Great. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Thanks. 
Uh, thanks for putting this on. Thanks, uh, Dr. Gross, for your comments. So we've, we've obviously seen, seen the placement of uh, the most recent generation of peer view into some nice high volume hospitals, including NYU. Um, maybe just adding on Matt's question, I mean, how, how has uh, the reception of peer view been among your colleagues? Is there buzz around it? Um, and separately, for, for docs that aren't using peer view, what, what are some of their reasons? Thank you. So, so first off, uh, we have a select number of physicians that work in, in the hospital setting. And so they, they certainly all have uh, access uh, to it. And, and we do have our, our director send out uh, emails and updates of you know, some of the new technologies that we have in the unit for them to use. Uh, it just so happens uh, our director is there pretty much every day. And that person does the lion's share of the work, but we are starting to see uh, the other physicians start to use it uh, you know, as, as well. Uh, I mean, it really doesn't change, uh, you know, how they perform colonoscopy because we're just putting this catheter, this sheath rather, over the colonoscope. So they just perform colonoscopy the way they normally do. And that's another nice uh, feature of PureView. Uh, one of the, the biggest things that physicians are always concerned about is that how is it going to impact how they perform the procedure they spent years to learn and master, and it doesn't change anything. Uh, it's still colonoscopy, but it just gives them the additional suction and the additional high power irrigation to successfully clean out that uh, colon. So, so each each month or each week, rather, uh, you know, we're seeing more of our doctors use it. But these are doctors that uh, uh, spend a fair amount of time in in the inpatient uh, wards. Got it. And um, I appreciate that slide you put up. Uh, basically incorporating peer view into the hospital protocol. Um, so I, I think that'll probably be a big piece to being able to uh, adopt this uh, more broadly. Um, but what do you think it'll take uh, maybe in addition to that to, to get peer view into the guidelines and, and other hospital protocols? Right. So, you know, everybody, you know, talks about guidelines. There aren't really any specific guidelines for inpatient colonoscopy, uh, first off. You know, we could talk about what's best practice. And, and I think that uh, uh, the partnership that MODIS is doing with uh, some of the big institutions that uh, were, were mentioned, you know, that's going to generate some additional clinical research. And that's going to further uh, solidify the story of the value of peer review. Uh, for patients uh, needing colonoscopy in the inpatient setting. And there's a, a very good chance that that will exponentially grow and spill over to the outpatient setting because the physicians are going to want to have it available to them there uh, as, as well. So, so it just takes, you know, a little bit of, uh, of, of time of, of growing that uh, literature, which uh, MODIS is nicely doing in collaboration with uh, uh, key opinion leaders at some of the large uh, hospitals. And I think we're going to see a, a nice uh, uptick uh, you know, over the over the coming months. Got it. All right. Well, great updates, and thanks for taking my questions. Great. Um, another uh, question that came in, and uh, obviously, Dr. Gross, you were uh, involved in the reduced study, which used the uh, the Gen One version of the system. And one of the questions is, is your thoughts on the changes from Gen One to Gen Two, and that, how that's helping to uh, to integrate peer review into your practice. Yeah, so so I think the you know the the biggest benefits that uh, I'm hearing about is that it's so easy to set up, uh, and uh, that that's probably the the big benefit from generation uh, one to generation two. We were using generation one uh, because uh, you know the irrigation and suction uh, uh, works very well, uh, but it's certainly easier now with generation two for the staff to quickly set it up uh, so the physician could use it. And I think uh, that's the, the, the positives of, of, a new, of this new version. And it's, it's, I think, also impacting how often we're using it because the, the staff is so comfortable uh, to, to get it ready. Thank you. Um, another question uh, for you, Dr. Gross, is, uh, you know, what do you see as the, the economic impact surrounding the implementation of peer review at, uh, at the NYU? Yeah, so, so I think economic impact, not just at uh, my medical center, but uh, any hospital uh, setting, is that the ability to um, uh, have these patients uh, leave the hospital from a, from a gastrointestinal perspective 
uh, faster. You, you know, they can have other reasons that are keeping them in the hospital. But when we think about uh, the patient that's in the intensive care unit for lower gastrointestinal bleeding, if we're able to do their colonoscopy and uh, intervene and, and treat, or just uh, have really good looks of the colon to say there's no further bleeding, that patient could get downgraded to a, a regular medicine bed. Uh, and then ultimately get discharged home, or if a patient's just admitted to a regular medicine bed or, or a monitored bed, and we're able to do their colonoscopy without delay because the cleanse isn't good, uh, then that patient will certainly uh, go home faster. And uh, there are tremendous economic benefits uh, and efficiencies uh, you know, for, for our hospital and, and other hospitals. So it certainly makes a lot of sense to offer the the highest level of care uh, for our patients and try to get them out of the hospital in, in a safe and efficient manner. Great. And what is your thoughts on, uh, on the learning curve and how quickly uh, physicians would pick up uh, the ability to use the device effectively? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, uh, you, you know, we're putting this sheath over the scope and colonoscopy is colonoscopy. Uh, you know, the, the diameter of the scope gets a, a, a little larger, but, but nothing uh, that would prevent a physician from safely navigating uh, from the beginning of the colon to the end. So I think the learning curve is quite short because it's, it's really just a, a tool that's being uh, put on our scope and uh, everybody knows how to do colonoscopy. So, so they're gonna use their standard techniques uh, to navigate the, the colon to get to the end of the colon and then to uh, investigate and look at the wall of, of the colon to try to identify the, the reason for gastrointestinal bleeding uh, in these patients. If you look at this inpatient population, you know, and this really focusing in on the extremely urgent uh, patients where you want to try to, uh, to get that colonoscopy done as early as possible, uh, you know, what percent of the overall inpatient colonoscopies, you know, would be these urgent GI bleeds or, you know, other, th other things that would drive, you know, the need to do an immediate colonoscopy? Yeah, so so when you know there there are different um, definitions of what we call urgent or emergent uh, uh, colonoscopy. You know, ideally, when someone comes into our hospital, we really want to have that uh, procedure done within 24 hours. You know, that's a pretty good uh, uh, benchmark. About 20 to 30 percent of uh, patients admitted to the hospital for gastrointestinal bleeding have lower gastrointestinal bleeding, which is is the colon. And, and when you think about how often one would use uh, the PureView system, it's not something that you would say, oh, I'm gonna use once or twice a month. This is something that we could use on a, on a daily or several times a week, you know, depending on, we don't know the types of patients that are gonna get admitted that are gonna have uh, gastrointestinal needs, uh, but uh, we see a fair amount of lower GI bleeding and it makes up about a, close to 30% of gastrointestinal bleeding that requires admission to the, to the hospital. And when we think of urgency, uh, the urgency is to try to get this safely done uh, within 24 hours. You know, you know, probably our sweet spot is probably between 12 to 24 hours uh, from when the patient uh, comes through the emergency room. Great. Um, if you uh, if you look at uh, just uh, some questions around what you see as far as the uh, the impact of of COVID, and do you you know are from your perspective, our hospitals, you know, kind of rebounded well, and are things coming back to you know pre-COVID volumes, or do you still see a uh, a little bit of a COVID overhang um, as far as the uh, the volumes in the? Uh, I mean, I, I think over, yeah. So it's a really important question, Mark. I, I think overall, um, you know, healthcare is uh, nicely rebounding, uh, both um, in the outpatient setting and in the inpatient setting. You know, thankfully in our health system, uh, you know, we have very few uh, patients with, with the uh, coronavirus and we're just dealing with the typical patients that we were dealing with, uh, but, you know, before the, before the pandemic. You know, is there a lag of, in terms of catch up, I'm sure, you know, everybody's having some catch up in their respective practices, but, uh, but in terms of the day to day, I feel other than having to wear masks, uh, you know, 24 seven, you know, it feels you know, pretty, pretty normal. We have changed our protocols a little bit uh, where we require, and this is a, a New York state recommendation to get the coronavirus testing before any elective outpatient procedure. And of course, any of our patients that come in and get admitted to the hospital, they also get tested as well. But in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, it, it feels pretty much the same as it was uh, pre-coronavirus. Terrific, thank you. Uh, just to jump into some questions that are a little bit more uh, 
I'll say corporate related. Uh, one of the questions here is what is the target number of hospitals with peer view by the, uh, the end of 2021? Um, this is a, a good question. And again, we will be moving forward um, at a nice pace uh, as we go through this year into next year. You know, we've really targeted to have the key number of institutions of our baseline uh, really to help guide us into 2021 uh, later this year in you know, approximately uh, 25 plus uh, institutions uh, by the end of the year. And then we'll, we'll think with those key influencer centers being on board, we'll really be able to grow that number significantly in, uh, in 2021. We haven't put out any hard guidance um, around that, but uh, we think we'll have some uh, some nice growth um, in hospitals, but really what will be key for us that we wanna do is make sure that we go as deep as we can in these early adopter hospitals, really showing you know, the nice penetration, getting that peer view protocol installed with significant physicians uh, using the product because we believe once we have a strong baseline you know, of hospitals that are really using it and instituted that protocol you know, in a very broad basis, that will then make us much more successful as we roll out into additional institutions as we move through uh, the next year and beyond. Just uh, jumping into some uh, initial, uh, an, another question for you, Dr. Gross. Um, question has come in is, do you see using the peer view in all of your inpatients or only in certain situations? Uh, that, you know, that, that's a really good uh, question. You know, I think for right now, you know, patients are still encouraged to, to drink the, you know, traditional four liter cleanse. Uh, but, but I think that uh, as we use the peer review system in a more frequent manner, I could certainly see our, our protocol changing in to, to some degree where maybe we have those patients just drink half. I think they're going to need to drink something uh, because we, we, you know, I think it's very difficult to, to deal with uh, uh, solid material in, in the colon. But, but if we could get to a point where we could adjust our protocols and algorithms to, to minimize uh, what a patient has to drink when they are preparing for an inpatient colonoscopy, uh, due to the, the benefits that we're seeing with PureView, we're certainly going to uh, do that. Terrific. Um, another question has come in to uh, if you can talk just a little bit more about the reasons um, you know, not only that you want to uh, avoid sending patients back, but you know, when you currently today, if you can't get in there and, and cleanse that colon, you know, what drives you to take, send a patient to, uh, to radiology, you know, and how much more invasive uh, is that, you know, and the, and the impacts of the, uh, the cost and length of stay of a patient when you start having to go into other areas outside of endoscopy or colonoscopy. Uh, sure. Sure, that's that's an important question. So, from a from a clinical point of view, you know, we'll we'll uh, go down that uh, pathway if someone uh, continues to have a significant amount of lower gastrointestinal bleeding, where we're seeing bright red blood uh, hemodynamically. Um, you know, if their vital signs like their blood pressure and heart rate, uh, if their heart rate starts to you know rapidly rise and their blood pressure starts to to decline, you know, it just uh, are signs to us that this person is actively bleeding. And uh, if we're not successful to, to identify the source, if we're convinced it's a lower GI source, which is the colon, and we can't identify that area because we can't properly wash out the, the colon, then we're going to need to involve other services to stabilize this uh, patient. And then the next phase would be interventional radiology, where they'll go the route of the, the, bl the blood vessels to try to look for that blush or activity uh, near the, the colon that would suggest the, the bleeding source. So, you know, we certainly uh, try to um, avoid that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gross. And I think at this point, uh, we will uh, wrap up the, the call. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, time and listening in and just wanted to let you know uh, that, oh, actually, you know, we'll allow one more question here from, uh, from Kyle Bowser. Kyle, if you'd like to unmute and jump in. Sorry, th thanks for sneaking me in. I just, just quickly um, on the corporate side of things, Scott, that looks like you're participating. I just wanted to ask you a question um, about kind of how you're looking at this opportunity, having kind of recently joined 
Um, are there any kind of low hanging fruit? Just kind of um, curious to hear your thoughts as to, um, you know, what, what made you decide to join uh, Modus GI? What seems compelling to you? Um, and then I'll, I'll just ask my second question uh, to, to Andrew. Should we still be thinking about the same kind of level of burn rate going forward? Thanks so much. Uh, great, thanks, Kyle. Uh, I appreciate your, um, you know, you're asking the question. So I've actually I've spent quite a bit of time now in the medical device field, um, mostly on the diag diagnostic side. So um, I've worked with scope companies as well as uh, advanced imaging technologies like uh, confocal endomicroscopy. And one thing I did know was um, as great as those technologies are, they are severely limited by the ability of um, the bowel prep and the, the limitations of the patient. So that being said, um, you know, I once approached it for Biomotus GI, I think the peer view system as, as sort of an enabling technology um, just makes a whole lot of sense for all of those advanced uh, technologies. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, so no, I, I think that um, it's a very compelling uh, product, obviously. Um, I think it serves a great purpose. Um, and I think that based on my history with these other companies, uh, you can really see the, the value of, um, of the enabling tool. And then the market size obviously is, uh, is compelling as well. So, you know, those things among the leadership team here were, uh, were really the biggest reasons for, uh, for making the transition to Modus. And, uh, and Kyle, just to, to your point on, on, on burn rate, and I'm not going to go too far uh, afield here on this uh, particular call, but, but yes, for the remainder of the, of the year for calendar 2020, um, you know, burn rate that, that we discussed in previous calls been publicly disclosed will, will continue no change there. And just as a general comment, um, I know there was a few, few questions there as we're, we're wrapping up just about, um, you know, the commercial progress in, in general on some quantifiable uh, facts and figures associated with that, of course, we'll, we'll go into all that detail um, through Q3, uh, as well as some of the post-closing uh, activity when we have our earnings call, uh, which is upcoming um, within the next uh, few weeks. I just wanted to mention that in general. Mark? Great. Thanks, uh, Scott and Andrew. Uh, so again, I will close the, uh, the call here. As, uh, as Andrew mentioned, you know, we'll be giving you know, more uh, detailed updates on our commercial activity. Uh, at our quarterly uh, earnings call uh, next month. Um, so stay tuned for that. And I uh, really appreciate everyone's time in listening in today. And thank you very much and hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Take care and thanks again.